Stan Gibalisco here. I'd like to discuss briefly a little topic called radiation resistance, a concept called radiation resistance. It has to do with antenna systems, and I discuss it in my book, Teach Yourself Electricity and Electronics, 5th edition, starting on page 505. I believe it's also in previous editions, but the most comprehensive coverage of all these topics is in the fifth edition. Radiation resistance is a special property that all antenna systems have. Suppose that we have just uh, hypothetically, here's a feed line feeding a piece of wire, say, in the center to form an antenna. And let's suppose that uh, this wire is a certain length and we operate this antenna at a certain frequency. A good example uh, in ham radio is say an antenna for the 7 megahertz band which would measure approximately 10 meters uh, on each side or 20 meters in overall length that's about um, 66 feet fed in the center with a parallel wire or coaxial feed line. This antenna exhibits something called radiation resistance that depends upon the length of this element and also on the frequency. The rigorous definition of radiation resistance is suppose that we have an antenna like this and it happens to be resonant at the frequency that we're working at. That's a good example, once again, of an antenna on the 7 megahertz band measuring 20 meters roughly from end to end uh, would be resonant as a half wave antenna on 7 megahertz. Let's suppose that we just take that antenna element and it's perfectly resonant now, remember, and replace it with a resistor, just a pure non-inductive resistor. And we pick that resistor to have a specific value. Let's just say R. This resistance has a value R. And we choose that value R so that the transmitter down here at the other end of the feed line and the feed line itself and everything that has to do with this feed line and transmitter sees exactly the same thing at this end with this resistor here as it did with the antenna. So if we take the resistor away and put the antenna back and fire up the system again, we'll get exactly the same picture at the transmitter as we did with the resistor. Either one, we can interchange them. The only thing, of course, is that <clears throat> There's not going to be very much signal transmitted from this little non-inductive resistor. The uh, antenna will radiate, but the resistor, theoretically anyway, will not. But the value of a resistor necessary in order to have that identical state of affairs, that value R, is the radiation resistance. And in the case of a free space, center-fed, half-wave antenna, that value would be approximately 73 ohms. That's just an interesting phenomenon that takes place. Now, the, if we have a shorter antenna so that it's not resonant anymore, then we're going to get reactants in addition to that resistance. However, we still get the, uh, some resistance there and that resistive component will be the radiation resistance. As we shorten the antenna, we will find that that radiation resistance decreases. Here's a graph, and it actually is shown in Teach Yourself Electricity and Electronics, 5th edition, as figure 27-1 on page 506. Here's our free space antenna fed at the center, this graph over here on the right. The length in wavelengths, 0, 1 half, and up to 1 wavelength. At a half a wavelength, as uh, we saw, it's about 73 ohms. 
That's the radiation resistance. If we make the antenna shorter, that resistance declines and in fact approaches zero as the length approaches zero. That's kind of counterintuitive. You would think that the resistance would go up as you make the antenna shorter, but that is in fact not the case. The resistance goes up as you make the antenna longer. And if you get to a point where the overall length is approaching one wavelength, that radiation resistance will skyrocket. A uh, vertical antenna operated over a perfectly conducting ground exhibits similar properties. However, it's generally considered to be resonant at a quarter of a wavelength on the 7 megahertz band then a vertical antenna that's resonant at a quarter wavelength would measure roughly 10 meters or 33 feet high. So what we have here then is a resonant condition and the radiation resistance is just about half of what it would be with the half wave antenna about 37, 36 and a half thereabouts ohms. If we make the antenna shorter, once again, we get a decrease in the radiation resistance. If we make the antenna longer, we get an increase. And again, it skyrockets theoretically towards infinity. However, because of the fact that there's a little bit of a charging current at the top of any vertical or the ends of any wire-fed antenna, you're going to get a little bit uh, less than infinity possibly several thousand ohms with a thin wire or maybe a couple of thousand ohms or a thousand ohms with a uh, metal tubing that you might use for example in a vertical antenna. <clears throat> so what is all this good for anyway? Well in an antenna system you're always best off if you can maximize the radiation resistance. That is to say then for a vertical antenna if you can get it a half wavelength long, you're going to get the highest possible radiation resistance. If you increase the length further than a half wavelength, it starts to decline again. And as the same situation applies here with a one wavelength center fed antenna, if you make it longer, the radiation resistance will begin to decline again. And in fact, it goes up and down and up and down as you approach resonance at uh, quarter wavelength multiples, odd multiples of quarter wavelength, or all integral multiples of a half wavelength. You always get these multiple resonances, just like you would in the tube of a musical instrument. So anyway, if you can design an antenna so that the radiation resistance is as high as possible, you're probably going to need an antenna tuner between the feed line and the antenna in order to get a match with the feed line so that your transmitter is happy. However, by maximizing this radiation resistance, you also minimize the loss in and around the antenna, minimize the actual power loss, because radiation resistance always appears in series with loss resistance in any antenna. You always therefore want to make the loss resistance as low as possible in proportion to the radiation resistance. Now there's two ways you can do that. One way is you can minimize the loss resistance by using very thick conductors and extensive ground planes in the case of a vertical antenna or low loss wire, thick wire in the case of a free space antenna. However, you can only do that to a certain extent. There's always going to be some loss. You can't get rid of the loss altogether. But if you can maximize this radiation resistance, get it, the uh, length of the antenna up near one of these values up here in the top regions of these graphs, then you will always decrease the loss because you will be making the proportion of the loss resistance to the radiation resistance lower and lower and lower. So that's one of the interesting things and that's why uh, the ideal length for a vertical antenna if you don't have a very good ground system in particular uh, 
is a half wavelength because you get a large radiation resistance in series with your loss resistance and you can get away with a lot more loss resistance that way. Just an interesting uh, little tidbit about how radiation resistance affects antenna efficiency. It's, it can get quite complicated when you get into the mathematics of all of it, but it's uh, important with antenna design to always minimize the ratio of the loss resistance to the radiation resistance, or we might flip that around upside down and say maximize the ratio of radiation resistance to loss resistance. That is again counterintuitive. You want the radiation resistance to be high. That suggests that it would make it difficult to radiate, but in fact it makes it easier. Difficulty in radiation results from low values of radiation resistance. I hope you, uh, that helps a little bit. You can read a little more about this in Teach Yourself Electricity and Electronics, 5th edition. That book, once again, Fifth edition. And you'll also find that that book has explanations for the answers to the final exam questions in the form of videos and web based text explanations for all the quiz an uh, answers at the ends of the chapters. In order to figure that out, you go to my website at Science Writer dot net. You don't have to capitalize the S, but I just tested it and uh, it doesn't do any harm if you do. This program that I'm making this video with capitalizes everything automatically. Drives me nuts. Stan Gibalisco signing off once again from the Black Hills of South Dakota, United States of America.